Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is enjoying what left we have of summer, and I just wanted to thank you all for chiming in this morning to, to listen on this discussion. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Glover, and I support the aftermarket sales here at Air Exchange. So we had a pretty diverse crowd uh, sign up for the presentation this morning, so I'm going to touch upon hopefully what is multiple areas of interest. Um, if I didn't include something that you thought I should include, or if you just have general questions, as always, feel free to reach out to me afterwards and I'll be happy to discuss those. So for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to discuss leakage as it pertains to energy recovery components. Um, on the agenda today, we're going to start by discussing the principles of leakage, followed by the system factors and drivers. Uh, we're going to discuss the characteristics and importance and how to calculate it. And then we'll end by just demonstrating some resources that are available to you. All right, so let's dive right in. So leakage is a natural operational characteristic of energy recovery wheels and plates. Now, for some of you, that may be the first time that you're hearing this, but plates do exhibit leakage. So that needs to be taken into consideration uh, when designing and operating a system. It's a universal characteristic, meaning that it's going to exist regardless of manufacturer materials or desiccants. Now, before we continue further, I wanted to take a moment to kind of frame this discussion. Leakage as it pertains to this webinar is going to be for comfort conditioning applications where water vapor is readily present. Uh, this discussion doesn't pertain to lab exhaust or process applications. And also, I'm not going to spend too much time discussing the science behind leakage. I wanted to spend more time speaking in more practical terms. So let's take a look at the operation of an energy recovery wheel. As you bring the outside air into the space, you're using that air to dilute the space air with fresh outside air and displacing the, uh, the stale air through the exhaust system. So starting with the exhaust air stream, that air naturally wants to progress through the wheel, allowing the wheel to recycle that energy and condition the incoming air. The resultant air streams are what is sent into the building and what leaves the building. So during this process, there is a portion of air that never actually makes it into the resultant air stream and bypasses back into the space where the air was taken from. Um, it's important to keep in mind that both air streams are going to exhibit this characteristic, uh, which is commonly referred to as leakage, cross-contamination, and a, a thousand other arbitrary terms. but. The technical term on the building side is the exhaust air transfer ratio. And subsequently on the outside, outside air side, it's the outside air correction factor. Um, now those are some long fancy names, but most folks abbreviate them to EATR and OACF respectively. Uh, it's, it's also important to keep in mind that these terms aren't something that I came up with. These are industry de defined terms and they're included in the ASHRAE standard 84, which provides the uniform method of test for energy recovery components. So starting with the exhaust air transfer ratio, the technical definition is the air quantity transferred from the exhaust to the supply air. Exhaust air transfer is typically attributed to carryover and leakage. Uh, so at this point, you may be asking yourself, what's carryover and leakage? Well, both of those items I'm going to discuss in further detail. Uh, so please keep a, a mental footnote as we move forward. Uh, EATR is a value that is represented by a percentage. Uh, so when this value is determined during the test, it's determined by measuring a concentration of a tracer gas that's measured at three points of delivery. Now, I just said something that's very subtle, but very, very important. EATR is a measurement of concentration, not an airflow measurement. Now, you all may be asking yourself, why does that make a difference? And it's, it makes a difference because by using a concentration, it allows you to measure and calculate a value that is independent of material and process, meaning that the value is based upon all influences that would encourage a component of the exhaust air to be delivered into the supply air.
Moving to the other side of the component, we have the outside air correction factor. The technical definition of outside air correction factor is a factor defined as the entering supply airflow divided by the leaving supply airflow. OACF is a reciprocal characteristic of EATR, and it's a value that is represented by a factor, and it's determined by dividing the mass flow rates of the outside air and the leaving supply air. Uh, so that's kind of different from the previous def definition, and once again, you may be asking yourself, why did they do that? Was it just to be confusing, keep us on our toes? No, the, the, the real reason that these items are, are used for very different purposes. Uh, EATR is used to um, give building designers and operators and make them aware of the concentration of the exhaust that makes it back into the supply. And OECF is used to give designers and operators and give them the ability to adjust their fan systems to compensate for EATR. So they're, they're different for practical purposes. It's to make everyone li everyone's lives a little bit easier. So what are the primary drivers that affect a leakage? Uh, you may remember from the previous slide where I defined EATR and I mentioned leakage and carryover. In comfort uh, conditioning applications, leakage and carryover are the primary drivers determining EATR and OACF. Leakage is a function of pressure. So now what determines pressure in a cabinet? Your fans do. Uh, more specifically, the fan location and the operating pressure as it corresponds to the energy recovery component. Each component is going to have a set of seals on both sides, um, the building side and the outdoor air side. The operational characteristics of the fan system is going to determine the static pressure. The static pressure determines the pressure differential across those seals that separate the supply and the exhaust air streams. The differential pressure across the airstreams is really the, the driving mechanism for leakage. The greater the differential, the greater this driving me mechanism is going to be. Carryover is a function of the mechanical operation. So as the wheel rotates between the airstreams, there is a certain volume of air trapped within the media. When it rotates from the exhaust stream to the supply stream, that volume of air will essentially get deposited into the subsequent leaving airstream. Therefore, carryover is primarily a function of the rotational speed and the geometry of the wheel. When you combine both these characteristics, carryover and leakage together, it forms the driving mechanism that uh, impacts EATR. So seeing that EATR is the characteristic of the wheel operation that determines what the concentration of exhaust air makes it into the supply air, everyone has a tendency to focus solely on that value. But it's, it's really important to remember that carryover and leakage isn't biased to one side of the component. It's going to occur on both sides. And in actuality, OECF is really that value that takes leakage into account on both sides. Therefore, so OACF is the practical value. It's going to tell you how much more airflow you need from your fans to compensate for the leakage and carryover. So you may be asking yourself, why do I care about how much leakage happens on the outside air side of the component? Well, it's because you're paying for it. Uh, the relationship between these two characteristics are reciprocal. As one goes down, the other goes up. Here you can see the percentage of EATR in blue goes down as the factor of OACF goes up in red. And as you move along this curve, the cost of operating a fan increases because you have to move more and more air to accomplish it. So the most efficient systems are going to want to strike a healthy balance between these two. So now that we have a basic understanding of leakage and the primary drivers behind it, you know, why are we here? Why is this important? Well, first and foremost, it affects indoor air quality. The purpose of the ventilation air system is to dilute the space air with fresh outside air and displace it. If the stale exhaust bypasses the component and essentially never leaves the space, it reduces the ventilation's effectiveness. So if the space needs a certain net amount of ventilation, these characteristics must be taken into account to design and operate the building properly. 
Uh, secondly, it affects the operational performance. It's expensive to condition and move air, so understanding these characteristics allows designers and building operators the ability to operate their systems at their most effective point. And third, and the one I'm going to talk about in more detail, is that acceptable leakage values are a defined building parameter in the ventilation standard. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the ASHRAE ventilation standard. Within the standard, there is a section for air classification and recirculation, um, which aggregates different space types and their relative level of contaminants, and provides a method to determine the appropriate amount of leakage. Within the section, the air is divided up into four different classes, class one through four. Class one is air with low contaminant concentration and inoffensive odors. Examples of this type of class would be classrooms, office spaces, assembly rooms, churches, corridors. Class two air is air with moderate contaminant concentration or mildly offensive odors. Uh, class two is your bathroom exhaust. So an example of this space would be restrooms, uh, swimming pools, dining rooms, locker rooms. Class three air is air with significant cont uh, contaminant concentration or significant offensive odors. Um, examples of this type of space would be kitchens, dry cleaners, beauty salons, pet shops. And lastly, class four air is air with highly objectionable fumes or gases um, or potentially containing dangerous particles. Uh, so this would be your lab, lab and process exhaust. So examples of this type of class of air would be paint spray booths, laboratory fume exhaust, uh, kitchen grease exhaust. So in that same section in the ventilation standard, it provides the method to determine what the proper leakage may be uh, based on the class of air you're exhausting. Uh, please keep in mind, if your exhaust airstream contains more than one class, then it always diverts to the highest class being exhausted. So for class one, recirculation or transfer of class one air to any space is permitted. There, there is no leakage limit. Now, is having an extreme amount of leakage practical or useful? No, absolutely not. So you'd want to limit it to a point where it isn't placing a burden on your fans. I'm gonna speak a little bit more about this in a minute. For class two air, recirculation or transfer of class two air to other class two or class three spaces is permitted. Class two air shall not be recirculated or transferred to a class one space. However, there is an exception for class two air, and that is when you're using, using an energy recovery device. Which states, when using an energy recovery device, recirculation from leakage, carryover, and transfer from the exhaust side of the energy recovery device is permitted. Recirculated air shall not exceed 10% of the outdoor airflow. Now, what did we discuss before? Well, EATR is the function based on leakage and carryover, so therefore your EATR value has to be below 10%. For class three, recirculation within the space of origin is permitted. Class three air shall not be transferred to any other space. But just like the previous slide, um, there's going to be an exception for when you're using an energy recovery device. Which essentially states that recirculated class three air shall not exceed 5% of the outdoor air intake flow, which means that you would have to limit your EATR to 5% or below. And finally, with class four air, you can't transfer or recirculate it to any other space, even within the space of origin. So therefore the net leakage rate is zero. So I get asked this quite a bit about the use of energy recovery in lab applications. Now, 
keep in mind we're talking about class 4 lab exhaust. There are class 3 applications, uh, but for, for class 4, the leakage rate is zero. And when you really break it down, what is zero? It's an absolute value. It's nothing. Um, now, could I take one of our components and set it up in a lab under steady state conditions, under ideal operating parameters, and demonstrate zero leakage? Absolutely, I could. Uh, the problem is, is you still have the uncertainty of the test and the tolerance of the sensor. The only true way to ensure that no exhaust air makes it back into the supply is to keep the air streams physically separate. So as a rule of thumb, we advise against using plates and wheels in class four air streams. So why do you think they went through all the trouble to include the classifications of air and the energy recovery portion of the document? Well, in my opinion, they wanted to take the guesswork out of what acceptable levels of transfer are and to provide proper guidance on how to balance the system. They wanted to make sure people had the ability to know that the system is providing an acceptable level of dilution. However, we are a conservative industry and there is a perceived risk and potential for transfer. Um, so I wanted to take a few moments to discuss the practical effects of the 5% and 10% requirements as stated in the ventilation standard. So looking at the table, what, what it's trying to demonstrate is with the space that has 20% more contaminants than what is acceptable, and you need to dilute it to an acceptable level. The 0% cross leakage represents pure dilution ventilation, which is going to set the baseline time required to achieve proper dilution within that space. Uh, taking that same case and including an energy recovery device operating at 5% EATR, means that it's going to take system the system one minute and eight seconds longer to achieve the same level of dilution as a system with zero percent and subsequently ten percent is going to take two minutes and 24 seconds longer now why am i going through this effort to show you this well because if you're a designer and operator it, it may sound like the best thing to do is conservatively get as low as you can uh, but there's a very real penalty for doing that and that penalty is increased fan energy consumption What you're doing is essentially taking energy saving gains from the component and using it towards higher fan costs. There's a case of depreciating returns. Um, now you may remember from the previous slide, when EATR goes down, the OACF goes up. And as OACF goes up, it increases fan energy use. So factoring in the electrical rates really demonstrates the true cost of trying to achieve very low EATRs. And in many cases, it can be quite costly. So we discussed earlier that the ASHRAE standard 84 provides the method of test. The rating of energy recovery devices is determined by AHRI standard 1060. The certified ratings include both EATR and OACF at three different pressure differentials. Anyone who participates in the certification program has to rate at a neutral pressure of zero inches and the other two points are chosen by the manufacturer. In regards to certifying equipment, AHRI 1060 is a pretty rigorous test. Afterwards, those values are then published on the AHRI directory for public view. Now, why is this important? Well, it demonstrates that EATR and OACF is equitable. This chart contains AHRI data from several different manufacturers, all with different media, geometry, and desiccants. And as you can see, these characteristics exist for everyone and aren't specific to a certain manufacturer. Uh, with that being said, leakage is application specific. Now, now, what does that mean? Well, it means it's going to change based on your airflow, fan location, fan location and operating pressures. Uh, so what most manufacturers have done is provide predictive modeling based on all these different factors. Uh, the air exchange software can be found at www.airexchangeweb.com. Uh, you would start by selecting a model, and then you would enter the desired net airflows, the fan locations, and operating pressures, and it's going to calculate for you what the EATR and OACF will be under those conditions.
So let's say you make a selection and EATR comes back higher than what you would like for the space. Um, maybe you have identified a reason to limit EATR to a certain value. You know, what are your options for lowering this value? First is you can make changes to your fan system and operating pressures. If your goal is to try and minimize leakage, there are certain types of fan arrangements that just accomplish this better. Uh, the most common fan arrangement that I see employed is a draw-through draw-through arrangement. Uh, because both sides of the airstream are under a negative pressure, this, this fan system does a fantastic job of keeping both EATR and OACF low naturally by just using the relatively lower pressure differentials across the seals. Um, how, however, if your goal is to solely minimize EATR, this arrangement makes it difficult to create those larger pressure differentials from the supply side to the exhaust side that you normally need to accomplish that. So oftentimes, the best way to drive EATR down by using a fan system is to place the supply side of the airstream under a positive pressure um, by moving the fan to the inlet side of the wheel. This arrangement allows you to create those higher pressure differentials that naturally want to keep the barrier from the air side, from the supply side to the exhaust side. Uh, but in doing so, keep in mind that your OECF is going to be a bit higher in this particular configuration. The second way to minimize EATR that is often used in conjunction with fan arrangement is the use of a mechanical purge. While fan arrangement and pressure is the best way to minimize leakage, a purge is the best way to minimize carryover. The purge allows you to use a certain volume of excess outside air to essentially flush the wheel of any entrapped air. We, uh, we called it carryover earlier. And it flushes this media out before it has the, or flushes the, uh, the air out of the media before it has a chance to be deposited in the leaving supply air. Um, however, I just want to point out that a mechanical purge has the most direct impact on a component's OECF as it does require excess amounts of outside air to accomplish this process. Uh, another thing that I wanted to point out is that a mechanical purge is the most effective when you have the supply fan on the inlet side of the wheel. So combining those two together is when you typically get higher amounts of OACF. Uh, purges are available on all our channel cassettes as a factory option. And once again, it's application specific. So the proper purge setting uh, you would determine by referring to the selection software. You would enter your flows, fan locations, pressures, and then you would enter your desired EATR, and the software is going to determine the proper setting to achieve that desired value. Okay, so that was quite a bit of information, and I'm not expecting everyone to remember everything, so where can you go to find more? I would first start off at our website, airexchange.com. Here you're going to find access to all our technical materials, contact information, case studies, relevant, uh, relevant industry information, um, as well as you'll find access to our aftermarket section, which features an online parts lookup and selection tool that's really designed to help folks who are in charge of maintaining and operating these devices in the field. Um, you're also going to find access to our replacement components section, uh, which provides uh, information on both replacement wheels and, and plates. And regardless of manufacturer, if you come across an inoperable component, we typically have a solution that's available for you. Uh, once again, we have our web-based software at ericsweb.com. Uh, this new software platform uh, keeps all of our configurations updated in real time, so you're always using the most relevant information. Uh, it also saves your information in the cloud and lets you collaborate with others who share the Eric's web platform. It's, it's, it's a really neat software solution, and I, I hope you all get a chance to check it out. And lastly, if, if you need to get a hold of me, here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out with comments on this presentation, uh, as well as if you have any idea for future presentations. I'm always happy to hear about those. Uh, with that said, I want to thank everyone for being here. And if you have specific questions, uh, we can enter them into the chat box now. So thank you very much.